Praise God. Yes, it's on. <laughs> Good evening. I hope you're all doing well. Um, you know, Santa asked me if I could open tonight. Of course, I'm always willing. Uh, I started wondering what should I talk about. Well, I started thinking about uh, transformation. It's something I've been thinking about probably since Sunday. Uh, it's uh, it's never easy for me to you know stand up here and address um, you know the congregation. I want to read you some scriptures for uh, that I found that talk about that. This one's Psalm 61.10, creating me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Uh, Ezekiel 18.31, cast away from all your transgressions, which you have committed, and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why will I die, O house of Israel? Ezekiel 36.26, moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Romans 12, 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove that the will of God is that which is good and acceptable and perfect. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, the new things have come. Ephesians 4, 22, 22 to 24, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Uh, Colossians 1, verses 22, 21, 22, and although you were formerly alienated in the hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. On the last one, Titus chapter 3 verse 5, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of reg regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. So I am in no way a perfect person. But I do know that I am transformed because probably three, maybe four years ago, me standing here addressing an audience, yeah, not going to happen. <laughs> I've always been afraid of public speaking. Yet, Sundays come, Wednesday come. And I actually want to get up here and say something, yeah. you know? And it's easy for me, uh, it's easier to do it now on Wednesday because there's usually less people here than it is on Sundays. I tend to get a little bit more nervous on Sundays than I do. But you know, I just get up here and let the Holy Spirit guide me to whatever message he wants me to give, relay, if it's a word for me, good. If it's for someone else, it's good as well. So that's just proof, you know, that uh, you don't have to put any effort to to change and become a different person. God's yeah. going to do it for you, yeah. you know. All you have to do is allow him to do it. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I got. Uh, I don't know if it, does anyone want to share something, prayer request. Testimony. Just keep Ellie in our, in our prayers. She's Is she better? She has come a long way. She opened her eyes one day. She was off the ventilator, but they did gallbladder surgery today. Okay. So she's back on the ventilator. And uh, I think, what did she say? That she would be in 20, 24, 24 hours. 24 hours or 48 hours that she'd be medicated. So Critical period, yeah.
Paul Jackson, who's uh, uh, did a lot of speaking on uh, dreams, uh, interpretations of his dreams. Uh, he went through a battle and he passed away today also, so just had good timing. John Paul Jackson. Let's continue to lift up those that are not here. You know, Mark, Laura, uh, you know, everybody that's not here and physically, but it, it's in spirit. And uh, my wife and, and my family, you know, I, I, I feel that, <clears throat> you know, we're being prepared for something that's going to be huge. God is revealing the Holy Spirit is moving in this place in a way. Always have never experienced it before because I'm a baby at this. Uh, but I think what's coming, yeah, it's going to blow up. So it's all good. Anyone else? No? Okay, well, let's stand. Uh, let's thank the Lord for bringing us together. Father, we thank you right now, Lord. For your goodness, Father, we thank you for bringing us together here. You said where two or three are gathering your name, that's where you are. And we know, Father, that you are here right now. We are in your presence, Lord. A presence, Father, that you continue to increase the manifestation of your glory in this place, Lord. We know that you are preparing us for what you are going to reveal, not only to this church, but to this region, to this state, to this nation, Lord. You have great plans for us, Father, and we are glad, we are, we are thankful that you have chosen us to be part of that plan. Father, right now we lift those that are in need of healing, Abby. Father, we declare right now that in your mighty name, she is completely healed. Don's co-worker, Dan's co-worker, right now, Lord, complete healing for the stroke of his wife. Father, comfort those that are in need of comforting, those that are oppressed, those that are sad, that are going through a loss, a trial, anything. Father, we feel who you are. For my family, for our reality, Father, right now I lift her up to you. And I know, Holy Spirit, that you are revealing to her what you what she needs to see and understand, Lord, so she can come to see you. The restoration, Father, is taking place. Right now, in your mighty name, Jesus. Father, we thank you, Lord. We magnify you, we worship you, we give you all the praise, all the thanks, Father. We give you our hearts, we turn our hearts, we transform us, Father. Thank you, Lord. We walk into this river, your river. Circumstances might say, Lord, that this, this church is empty, but we know that it is not. Because you are calling your children, and there are many that are being called in this place. And they are going to answer your call, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We praise you, Father. Thank you, Lord. It is for We don't have any announcements, so let's uh, speak the word. Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? 
I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened. And I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Thank you, Lord. Tammy, would you please? And Izzy, too. Worship the Lord. Thank you for those that have come out this night and those of you who weren't able to make it tonight because of the cold. Let the Holy Spirit reign even where you're at tonight. As the Holy Spirit moves in this place, even as Jesus healed the servant of Centurion because the Centurion had faith, that his servant was healed, even as Jesus spoke it, not even in the same place. So we speak healing, even those that are watching. And even in this room, the restoration that the Lord brings forth we thank you, Lord.
together wonderful to me So
Reveal yourself through your people, Lord. Reveal your grace and your mercy, Lord. Release the kingdom that hides within your people. be the light of the world in a dark and dying world. Let us be the light of the world for your glory. Let us be the light of your world to glorify and magnify. Be the light of a dying Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. We love you tonight, Lord. We bless you and praise you. Thank you for your presence, Lord, your abiding presence. Lord. Never leaves us and forsakes us. We thank you, Jesus. I ask you to bless those that have come out tonight, Lord. Minister to them by the power of your spirit. Let us all experience your love, your favor, your very presence, Lord. We bless you tonight. We love you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. God bless you. You may be seated. Thanks to the worship team and Izzy. Praise the Lord. Thank the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah, Jesus. I want to talk to you a little bit tonight about uh, evangelism. I'm not, uh, I'll probably be doing more of this here in the future. Not, not consistently, but I'm hoping that we're all kind of coming to a better understanding of the grace of God and the finished work of the cross. It's not something that, uh, you know, you just 
preach it as though it were a particular doctrine. It is the gospel, so it's a continuous uh, teaching and preaching of that that we have to have and need to have in order to be uh, able to function as the righteousness of God in Christ and, uh, and to be able to believe for the things that God wants to do in our lives without any sense of condemnation and, and so forth. But <clears throat> we also need to be reaching out to others and we need to do it in a way that's uh, spiritually accurate and uh, halfway smart. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it's really easy to offend people and we don't want to do that. Uh, sometimes people are offended just by virtue of the fact that it's the gospel that happens, it happens, but we don't want to be offensive in the way that we present the gospel or the way that we represent Jesus. And, uh, so sometimes we need a little wisdom in order to do that, and I think the best way is to see how Jesus did it and uh, try to follow that example. Because there's lots of things that we hear and see in, in quote-unquote Christianity that really isn't much like Jesus at all, and uh, so it's confusing to people, I think when we try to present Christianity in a way that doesn't uh, align with Christ. Mm -hmm. It sounds almost like a, you know, that, that it's an oxymoron, but the fact is, it, just because it's called Christianity doesn't make it like Christ. You know? I mean, there's a lot of things going on in what's thought of as Christianity that really doesn't uh, reveal Jesus in a very accurate way. So I'm, before we go to the message tonight, um, I'm going to just I'm going to start with uh, John chapter one verse one. Uh, I'm not going there right this second. I want to tell you a little story. I heard this just the other day, and I thought it was really appropriate because how many of you ever watch uh, Christian television? There you go. Well, I mean, there's there's good stuff on Christian television. There's some other stuff on Christian television that's kind of weird too. It's not all good, like anything. There, it has its moments, praise the Lord. I watch Christian TV, watch it quite a bit. Uh, but I've kind of narrowed my viewing down to certain shows that I, the others just kind of freak me out and irritate me and kind of get me out of the spirit, so I, I just don't watch them. But I do flip through, just like I do with other channels, and I'll catch something, and I'll go, whoa, what was that? And try to get back in and see what the context was. Some of it's pretty, pretty bizarre. But here's a, here's a little here's a story about this little boy who really didn't know anything about Jesus, but he wanted a bicycle, and his mom and dad either couldn't or wouldn't get him this bicycle. So he, you know, just kind of trying to figure out different ways that he could do it. He was too young to get a job that would pay him enough to to buy the bicycle. So uh, one of his friends said, "Well, why don't you ask?" Jesus for the bicycle. Well, he didn't know how to pray. He'd never prayed before, and he didn't know how to ask Jesus for a bicycle. So he, he started watching Christian television. And he thought, I'll, I'll just find out, and then I'll, then I'll know how to ask. So the first day, he turns on Christian TV, and he gets this, this church, one of these like Anglican high uh, you know, ritual type of church, and he, he watches it. And so then he after he gets off the program, he goes into his bedroom, he gets, kneels down by his bed, and he starts praying, and he says, uh, Oh, uh, the most, thou most high God, uh, wouldest thou, if it be thy will, to giveth thy servant a bicycle, to glorify thyself with this gift, and testifieth to thy will, if it pleaseth thou to give unto thy humble servant a bicycle, do so tomorrow morning, amen. <laughs> he gets up the next morning, no bicycle. So he goes back to Christian TV and he finds another channel. And he watches this one. It's, a, it's like a charismatic uh, channel. So he watches this for a couple of hours and then he goes back to his bedroom, gets on his knees by his bed, and he begins to pray again. And he says, uh, I declare tomorrow, 8 a.m., my bicycle will be in the front yard. I receive a red bicycle with chrome fenders. I believe it, and I receive it. Tomorrow morning, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, 
next morning, he gets up, goes out, no bicycle. So the third day, he goes to another channel. He watches it, a couple of three hours, gets off the TV, goes into the other room, picks up a statue of Mary, walks out of the house, goes out into the woods, and he's gone for about two hours. He comes back, his mother sees him without the statue, and she follows him, and he goes into his bedroom, and he gets down, kneels by his bed, and he says, Lord, if you ever want to see your mother again, <laughs> <laughs> praise the Lord. So, uh, I, I'm saying, we, you know, so much of Christianity has turned into a, something other than revealing Jesus. It, it's, it's almost about consumerism and uh, selling a product, you know, like we're selling our doctrine, we're selling our denomination, we're, we're, we're selling our belief system. And send us some money and, you know, we'll, we'll see to it that Jesus, we'll, we'll, we'll give you the steps to get Jesus to, to answer your prayer. Now, I believe in sowing seed and uh, giving, you know, where, where you feel led to give. But I think there's just so much, so much bogus stuff being thrown around out there. Now think about this. As Christians, we watch these things and we can kind of filter out by our own, you know, relationship with the Lord, what we're going to take and what we don't take. Now we don't get too freaked out when we see other stuff. We just kind of, it's just disappointing. You know what I mean? Right. But imagine the unbeliever right. that comes to this and, and sees some of the things that go on. It's got to just completely baffle them if they're thinking that's the way the Lord is. I mean, don't you think it's it's just it's just bizarre? So we want to we want people to know Jesus, but we want them to know Jesus, you know, not some organization or some consumer report, you know. We really want them to understand Jesus, and this is a personal relationship, and Jesus will deal with your needs personally, you know. If you have faith, if you trust the Lord, He works all things out for your good. But it's it's part of a process. And I, don't, I just don't think you can do the, you know, three steps to the Mercedes thing and just expect <laughs> it to work. You know, I mean, there, he'll supply our needs, and he does. And he'll, do, he'll give exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. Those are true. And I, I don't, I'm not saying we shouldn't uh, believe that God wants to prosper us because he does. But not in the, you know, bizarre kind of, commercial way that, that we see it being promoted so much of the time. So with that in mind, I want to talk to you about personal evangelism and how, how I see Jesus interacting with people. Because there's all kinds of people out there in the world. They're all different. And let me, let's just say this. Although there, there's one plan for salvation in terms of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, most all of us came a different path. Because he is a personal God. He is relational. And so he, he might speak to John one way in the way that he drew John to him and me in a different way. Right. Now, we're all going to have to trust in that death, burial, and resurrection for our salvation. But it, the way that he approaches us is different because we're all different. And we, all, we're, we were all in different situations and circumstances when we turned to the Lord. So it's true with people in the world, too. And, and a lot of times we live in, a, in, in a, this postmodern, it's called, world where people are so, they think they're so intellectual. I mean, actually, it's, you know, for me, I was, you know, I was working a job. I was doing the stuff that everybody does. I was trying to support a family and so forth. But I was in drugs. I was in alcohol. And, and uh, just, it was, I was a mess, you know. But, but I... I didn't have a sense of being so brilliant and so bright that I couldn't believe in a God. Fortunately for me, as a little kid, I knew I was taught in Sunday school and stuff, so I knew that there was a God. I just didn't think he wanted to have anything to do with me because I was such a mess. But there are people today, and many of them, uh, in our colleges and in the professional world who just think they're too smart to be Christians. Right. That Christians are just ignorant and 
stupid and, and the whole thing is just foolish. So that's kind of the thing I want to talk about this morning or this evening uh, to some degree. But, but in, in, in general terms, um, evangelism. Amen? Amen? And we'll do that by starting uh, here in John chapter 1, verse 1. And he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, what's interesting is that in the beginning was the Word is actually logos in, in Greek. And the Greeks were a philosophical kind of intellectual people. And so they had this, this idea that they believed that the universe had a, a, a rational and a moral order to it. And this order of nature was what they called logos. We think of logos in the biblical sense that it's Jesus because that's what John tells us. But that's not, John is borrowing a phrase because this is in Greek. Remember, this is being written in Greek. And a lot of it's going out to Greeks and to other Gentiles. And so he's using this thought of the Greeks to express something. Now, in uh, the, that word logos is in the, uh, in fact, would, Sally, would you go back and get the uh, concordance off of my thing back there? I meant to bring it out, and I was going to, I want you to see this, and uh, it's, uh, it's, 3056 is actually the number in, in Strong's concordance, but it comes from a uh, Legius, which is uh, 3004, I believe. I want to actually read you the, the uh, Greek definition here. just before 3057. Thanks, John. <laughs> my, my Greek is just a little bit less than my math. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Here it comes. Okay. Logos. It's, it comes from 304, which I want to go back to as well. I want to read you both of them. That would be 300 after 3, right? <laughs> Praise the Lord. John came and saved us a little time, at least tonight. Hallelujah. <laughs> this is a really big book. Okay, so here we go. 3056. Three, oh, is the uh, is the uh, logos something said the thought by implication a topic subject of discourse also reasoning the mental faculty or motive by extension a computation okay and then it goes on to talk about what John said but then it comes from the original word is lego where we get the word Legos for toys. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, that's the primary verb that it comes from. But it means relate, usually of systematic or set discourse, whereas generally refers to an individual expression or speech, respectively, while to break silence merely means an extended or random harangue by implication to mean, to bid, to boast, describe, give out, name, put forth, show, and utter. So here's, but here's where the, the, the combination of those is what the Greeks used. And to them, it was a, it was an order of nature. It was a system, so to speak. And they called it logos, a way of life, in other words. And so to them, the meaning of life was to contemplate and discern this order in the world, this logos, this system, right? They defined it 
like this. A well-lived a well -lived life is one that conformed to this logos, to this system, this way of thought. Okay? So John borrows from the Greek this philosophical term, logos, and he says this then about Jesus. Let's, let's read uh, uh, 1 through 3 here and then drop down to verse 14. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So John then, he affirms that, that there is this next word, which is telos. And telos is uh, 5056 in here. And telos is from the primary to set out for a definite point or goal, a position, the point aimed at as a limit, the conclusion of an act or a state or a termination. So John affirms then that there is a telos, or in other words, a purpose to our lives. You get it from what I'm saying here? There's a purpose for our lives, something that each one of us was made for. Something that we have to recognize and honor in order to live well and to live free. Praise the Lord. John says the world isn't just the product of blind, random forces that mean nothing. But the meaning of life is not a principle or some other abstract thought or, or structure or rational uh, way of looking at things. But the meaning of life is a person, an individual, a human being who actually walked the earth. Now, to the Greeks, that, that was insanity. Mm -hmm. They had this philosophy about life, and what John does is take it out of that context and says, hey, this philosophy you got, that logos you're talking about, it's a person. Mm -hmm. yep. It's not a way of thinking. It's not a mindset. It's, it's not the, the philosophy that drives your purpose in life. But it's a person who gives you purpose for your life. Right. Yes. Amen? Yes. And so he goes on and, and he said to, to the Greeks, as I said, this is crazy. But if Christianity was true, then a well-lived life wasn't found in philosophical contemplation or intellectual pursuits which would have left out and still would leave out the vast majority of humanity. Right? right? I mean, most of us are not involved in philo philo philosophical pursuits or intellectual, you know what I mean, obviously we have an intellect and so we do some things that are intellectual, but we're not in the pursuit of intellectual, intellectual perfection. Most of us are too busy trying to earn a living. Right. You know, we're making a we're trying to get by. We're trying to get through. We can't just lay around and meditate on our navel or, you know, some other thing as a way of life. And that's what John, that's what John is pointing out, that if that were the case, you would eliminate the vast majority of humanity if that's what the purpose of life is. You see what I'm saying? So instead... It, this, this purpose, this logos, is found in a person to be encountered in a relationship that could be available to anybody, anywhere, from any background, any intellect, anybody can experience this. Not just the, the philosophical people or the intellectuals, but it's for everybody. Praise the Lord. And so then... To show, this is what John's doing here. And so to show how that works in real life, he begins immediately with this discourse from uh, Jesus with these students what, who would become students of his or disciples of his, amen, who were wavering back and forth. If you remember, before we get into this, we're going to go to John 1, 43 uh, through 51 here. 
But before I start reading that, leading up to this, you've got, these are actually people who knew of John the Baptist and understood his teaching that a Messiah was going to come. And now John has pointed to Jesus as being this Lamb of God, this Messiah. But these guys are still debating about whether or not he is. They do believe in a Messiah. They're just not sure. I mean, in fact, originally they thought it was John. And John says, no, it's not me. I'm just here to point the way to another one. So now these are all people who were aware of John's teachings. And they were not convinced that Jesus was the one. They were still questioning. You see what I'm saying? And so now Jesus comes along in, in beginning at uh, verse 43. And it says, The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee, and finding Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? <laughs> Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and saith of him, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, Thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So, Nathaniel is at the least an intellectual snob. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if you read it in the context that is being, that is being delivered here. Right. And, and worse, he may even be a bigot. Yeah. I mean, hey, come on, this whole, our whole world is this way. We're always dividing up and finding something to blame stuff on. Now it's those people. You know, the ones that live over here. Or the ones that have that color skin. Or the ones that, you know, whatever. We, we always are looking for someone that we can say we're better than. Maybe not, you know, outwardly, but inwardly. Even if we're not saying it, people are thinking it. And it's, you know, and we're not talking about stupid people. Because... Germany was one of the most highly educated nations in the world leading up to World War II. Mm -hmm. And they were the most bigoted, racist, insanely so, right. of anything we've ever seen. Right. It's not a question of, of education, but nevertheless, here's, here's the deal. Here, Nathaniel's in... You're telling me this guy's got the answers? I don't think so. <laughs> He's rolling his eyes. He's from Nazareth? Yeah. Come on. Can any good thing come out of there? He's from Nazareth? Really? <laughs> and you're going to tell me he's the answer to our problems? He's, he's going to give us the direction? Hey, hey, there's a lot of people today. I mean, look, it, look they look at Christianity like Nazareth. Right. God loves you. Jesus wants to bring uh, fullness to your life. He wants to solve those deepest and, 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 and most painful issues in your life. Really? <laughs> Christianity is going to do this? I mean, it's the same mentality. Nazareth? Can anything of any value come out of Christianity? You see what I'm saying? And that's, that's, that's the, the conversation that's taking place here. They, people look a lot like Nathaniel looked at 
Nazareth is the way they look at Christianity. And by the way, Christianity was from Nazareth. Right. And I'll remind you, it still is. Right. So people still roll their eyes at Christianity. Uh -huh. And the claims that we make of who Christ is, what he's done, and what he can do, what he wants to do. Amen? Amen. The first and most important aspect of, of this Nathaniel story is the problem of pride and contempt. But beyond that, despite the ridicule that he had, he has a deep and an underlying spiritual hunger. Remember that about the people you come into contact with. They'll ridicule Christianity. They'll mock it. <clears throat> What's going to come out? Oh boy, Christianity. But don't doubt that they have a, a spiritual hunger. They may have it covered up. They may have it hidden. Mm -hmm. But they've got it, believe me. It may be something that only comes out late at night, early in the morning, all alone, whatever. But it's, it's there. It's in everybody. Praise the Lord. Let's go to look at John chapter 1, verse 46. 1 and 46, yeah. Again, we're talking about how Jesus dealt with people. Nathaniel said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said, Come and see. Praise the Lord. Look at verse 49 then. Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. So once Jesus gives some credible evidence, Nathanael shifts all of his allegiances from ridicule and bigotry he moves to, you're the Messiah. I mean, he does it in a hurry. It's within like three verses. It's quick. In fact, it's probably too quick if you continue to read this discourse that's taken place. Look at verse 50. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree. Is that why you're believing? You're going to see greater things than these. Now, Jesus kind of rebukes him here. And why? Because he doesn't take the time to really think this thing through. Now, does that surprise you that Jesus would do that? I mean, if you read, read are you reading this in the context that I'm talking about? I mean, mm -hmm. can you see what is happening here? Yeah. On the one hand, he's going, oh, come on, Nazareth. And one verse, then the next verse is, you're the Messiah. You're God in the flesh. And Jesus said, why? Because I said I saw you under the tree. He said, that's nothing. And so Jesus is kind of rebuking him for making this snap decision based on something that just kind of came out of nowhere. Right. And, he, and he kind of corrects him. And I mean, it doesn't surprise me. I think it should surprise us, you know, based on where we're coming from, where we most of us have been. But it really doesn't surprise me when you really look at what Jesus is doing in people's lives. Mm -hmm. Because just like this Nathaniel, despite people's arrogance, despite people's pride, inside they still have a hunger. Mm -hmm. They'll blow you off and, oh, come on, that's a dean. Does he know? You know? Nathan? Okay, yeah, right. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? But that doesn't mean they don't have a hunger. Just because they've got some pride, just because they're arrogant, just because they don't want to admit that they've got the same issues everybody else has got, and they're trying to fill these holes, and they're trying to figure it out, and they're trying to get make sense out of everything that's going on in their life. Praise the Lord. Underneath that skepticism, underneath that pride, there's a lot of covert spiritual searching going on. Uh -huh. 
If that were not true, you wouldn't have psychic hotlines, you wouldn't have Ouija boards, you wouldn't have voodoo, you wouldn't have all the other junk that's available out there in the world. They're looking for something spiritual, they just don't know where to look. And it's amazing to me how they can be too proud and too arrogant to turn to Christianity, and yet they'll dial 900 psychic hotline, you know, mother whatever, <laughs> and believe that, you know, or get out the Ouija board or the eight ball. Yeah. What do you think about this? It could very well be. <laughs> My God, did you see that? That's oh, amazing. See, I mean, it's, but that's people. That's the way people are. They do have a hunger, nevertheless. So in spite of this Nathaniel's bluster, he still went with Philip to meet Jesus. In spite of this attitude of, really? Nazareth? Or we could say, really? Christian? He still went to church with him. He still went to see Jesus. Even though he was mocking the whole thing and acting like that's just crazy. I don't believe any of that stuff. Inside there was something, a hunger. Yep. And so what did, what, what did Philip do? He just said, come on and see. Come see for yourself. Come on. You know, I tell people, look, don't take my word for it. You need to get alone somewhere and talk to God. Right. Ask him to tell you if he's real. Ask him to show you if he's real. Come on. Are we too paranoid? You think God can't do that? Come on. If they're honest, if they're sincere enough to, to reach out to God, they don't have to know how to pray. Come on, let's, let's face it. None of us are you know, experts. We just kind of fumble around and try to figure out some way of reaching out to God. He, he's more than able to deal with us wherever we are in our abilities and our expertise, if you will. I mean, just say, look, give it a shot. What do you got to lose, man? Yep. Just, if you don't know if there's a God, if you're not sure about this, Jesus, ask him to show himself to you. Ask him to be real to you. That's all he's wanting, an opportunity. Praise the Lord. So, let's go back to John chapter 1, verse 49 again. And we'll go 49 through 51. Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, because I, because I told you I saw you under the fig tree, that's why you're believing? You're going to see stuff way more than this. Verse 51. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, unto you, this is Jesus speaking, hereafter you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So here's Jesus, and he's, he's basically, I'll paraphrase it, he's saying, oh, you know, first you were too skeptical, now you're ready to adopt me. Come on. Right? You didn't believe anything a minute ago, now all of a sudden you're ready to jump on the bandwagon and go full blast and do the whole thing. But he says, I haven't even begun to talk to you about who I really am. Come on. You've got this little taste here that I saw something supernatural. You know, yesterday you were rolling your eyes, and today you've had an emotional experience. Mm -hmm. You found somebody with a supernatural knowledge of you. And you've bought hook, line, and sinker now. Slow down. And don't be so impressed by appearances. Right. Because you really still don't understand who I am. Now, I want to ask you, and you don't have to raise your hand or anything, but just think about this. When you first come to the Lord, did you, do you know what you know about the Lord today? Nope. I mean, when you first heard about the Lord, wherever that was when you were a kid and then you went through your life and did whatever you did, and, or maybe you were an adult before you came to know the Lord. But when you first came to God, I mean, you've got to say, he's way more than I thought. Amen. There's a lot more to this than I imagine. Right? People, I mean, that's why we've got a lot of different denominations, to be quite honest with you, because you go to a church, you have an, in, uh, an encounter with Jesus, and now all of a sudden you assume that because that 
was, you know something happened, something real happened, and because of that, now you figure everything else they're doing must be true too. After all, I met the Lord there, right? You could meet the Lord in a roller rink. That doesn't mean you gotta wear skates to church, you know what I mean? But that's kind of the, what, the way we deal with it. Praise the Lord. So anyhow, he's, he's going on here. He's saying, he's saying, now slow down. Because you don't even have a clue about who I really am and what is available through me. So let's go now to John chapter 20 and verses 24 and 25. Now this is, uh, you know, this is obviously 2,000 years ago, but believe me, people haven't changed it. We're, we're dealing with the same thing today that Jesus dealt with 2,000 years ago. So, but Thomas, one of the 12 called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, we've seen the Lord. But he said unto them, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. So, I've seen the Lord. And the person I'm talking to says, well, I haven't. And unless I see something tangible, I'm not believing. Now, it's interesting here because look at verse 27 and 28 now. Then saith he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hand. And reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Now, you see, Jesus doesn't say, how dare you question? Mm -hmm. That's what we say. But that isn't what Jesus said. He didn't say, how dare you? How dare you question my veracity? my reality, my truth. Amen? He says here, look, stop disbelieving and start believing. Let me, let me just say something. You know, when you read the, in the Gospels, all four Gospels, Resurrection Day, the disciples, you know, Mary is the first one down to the tomb. The disciples come, Mary looks, he's not there. She's going around crying, looking for the Lord, can't figure out where he is. The disciples come, Peter goes in, he sees the, the grave clothes, the, the cloth that was over his face. He's looking there, he's going, what the deal here? And, and, and you know, it, you gotta think, he's thinking, well now if somebody stole the body, why would they unwrap it? You know? And if if he if he just had passed out and came back to life, you know, woke up, uh, how come everything's all neatly folded and placed, you know, like this? <coughs> He's questioning. Mary is freaked out. They, the, the other disciples, she looks back in the tomb and hears an angel sitting at the head of the the bench that he was lying on, and an angel sitting at the foot. And she says, have you seen my, the master? She says, my master, where have they taken him? Where, where is he? And then she goes out, and she's weeping, and, and Jesus comes up behind her. She sees him, doesn't recognize him. And he says, what are you, what, what are you doing? And she said, she's thinking he's the gardener, it says says, do you know where they've taken my master? And then Jesus speaks again, and he says, Mary. And the moment he speaks her name, she realizes it's him. Uh -huh. And she wants to go and grab him and hug him and everything. And he says, no, don't touch me. I haven't ascended to my father and your father, my God and your God. Go and tell the disciples what you've seen. Now, here's the amazing part about this couple of things, but one is that when Jesus speaks to her personally, immediately she recognizes right. it. Because it's a personal thing. You can hear it, you can hear about it, you can see things, 
But each one of us know we had a personal encounter in some way or form or fashion. Yep. Probably different for all of us, but we know it became real to us. He became real. It became a personal thing. Not just a religion, not just because other people believe this, but something happened. Right? Yep. Well, the other thing is, these disciples, I could go back and show you the scriptures over and over and over. He told these same disciples, I must die. The Son of Man must die, be buried, and raised on the third day. There's at least a half a dozen times in each one of the Gospels that he tells them this. Now, what's up? I mean, why didn't it ring with them? I mean, what happened that on this day, they didn't, why weren't they all down there waiting for him to come out of the tomb? And why, when they found the tomb empty, did they think somebody stole him? Because they didn't believe. They really didn't understand. So, I mean, it's amazing. So we think, well, Thomas, you you slug, you know, why, why didn't you believe? Hey, nobody believed. Right. Jesus wasn't freaked out by it. Mm-hmm. He said, come on, come see for yourself. Now, if the people that lived with him for three and a half years of his ministry, people that were that close to him, that heard him his, from his own mouth say, I'm going to be killed. I'm going to be buried. But I'm going to be resurrected. Mm -hmm. And couldn't believe it. Don't you know that it's difficult for people who've never heard of Jesus or been around Jesus or read anything about Jesus or had any relationship with Jesus to believe it when we tell them. (laughs) That's why the Holy Spirit has to draw them. That's why I said Sunday. Our job is to have the conversation. His job is to do the conversion. We need to say, come and see. Right? And if they have come, if they'll show honest desire or or, or even uh, curiosity, it's enough. It's enough for God to deal with them. Doesn't mean everybody that comes is going to throw up their arms and, and say hallelujah and Take me, Jesus. But some will. And it's seed being sown. It may not happen here. That that encounter that you have, it may not happen in your presence. But you're sowing seed. It could still happen if it happens five years down the road, if it happens on their deathbed. It doesn't matter. They just need to know that this is the truth, that Jesus is real. And they they give you arguments like, well, come on, I can't. It's... We live, in a, we live in a time when people don't believe in resurrections. Right. I mean, let's face it. People today don't believe in it. Well, as I said, the people of that day were no different than us. Right. That's why I know it's true. Right. These people would not have been converts to Christianity if they hadn't seen him Resurrected, right. because we saw what happens at the beginning. They don't know. They don't. They're not believing anything. Right, right. They believe because they saw him. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is, when you when you look at when when they pick out the people to in the in the days that Jesus lived, and during this the writing of this, women could not testify in court, not in Israel nor in Rome. Their, their testimony was worthless. Right. Now, if you're trying to start a new religion, mm-hmm. don't you think you're going to be looking for somebody that everybody's going to believe? Right. Nobody believed a woman. Mm-hmm. And yet, people were converted. People got saved. Come on. People believed. Amen. Which tells me that people saw a risen Savior. We know that he was seen different times over 40 days after his resurrection. People believed it because they saw it. Mm-hmm. Just give God a chance. Amen. Open the door and see what he can do. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. You know, when you first come to Jesus, and this is, this is true of all of us probably, and certainly not unusual, we're kind of guarded. People are guarded. They come, they want to believe, but, they, but they're afraid to believe. They kind of hedge their bets because they figure, well, he might not do it. You know, maybe he won't heal me. Maybe he won't save me. Maybe he won't reveal this to me. Maybe, you know, he'll give me a little something, but I'm not probably going to get answers to the big questions. Probably not going to get the answers to the real, real big issues in my life, right? But maybe he'll make me a better person. That's what a lot of people think. That's what a lot of people do when they first start going to church, when they first come to the Lord. They're hedging their bets. They're staying guarded. Whether their needs are ever going to get met or not. But when you actually find him, he'll always be more than you ever imagined him to be. Nathaniel, he said, you're going to see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, he's referring to, to, to Genesis yep. and Jacob in the Old Testament at Bethel, house of God, God's house is what Bethel means. And what happened? If you go back and read that, it'll say he saw this ladder and there were angels and they were ascending and descending. And at the, at the top of the ladder, he saw God looking down at him. And he's, that's why he named it. This is God's house. This is where God invades earth. Right? Amen. So what Jesus is saying to here to Nathaniel is, look, you're all freaked out and ready to, you know, start this religion up because I said I saw you under a fig tree before you could see me. I'm telling you, I'm going to be the one put you in the very presence of God. A mm-hmm. whole lot more to this than a prophecy. Amen. Way more than a vision. Mm-hmm. Amen? Amen? I can give you the presence of God. Hallelujah. That's what he's telling him. There's so much more about me than you have even begun to imagine. Mm-hmm. You've settled for a little something that you thought was supernatural, and it, and it is supernatural, but it's nothing. It's nothing compared to what I want to give you. Nothing compared to the supernatural reality of what you can have in this relationship with me. See, none of us have arrived. None of us have gotten to the fullness of what God wants to do for us and to us and through us. We've got some things. We've had some experiences. We've had some issues. We've had some things. And, but Jesus is always saying to us, as well as to the, to the new convert, for that matter, there's so much more. There's so much more that you haven't even been able to ask me for yet. You're not even aware that it's possible. Amen? Amen. So Jesus makes this incredible claim that he is that ladder. He is that opening. He is that means by which we have the presence of God. Praise the Lord. Amen. He is, back to my original premise, logos. Yeah. The purpose for everything. Hallelujah. The goal. The end all of the be all. Amen. Or the be all of the end all, however you want to say it. Amen. Amen. He's, a, he's everything. He's the first. He's the last. He's, he's all in all. He's the logos of the universe, the bridge between heaven and earth. You can almost hear Jesus laughing. You think I'm the Messiah. You think I've come here. You're looking for me to jump on a big white horse and and throw down the Roman Empire. I'll show you greater. Because doing that wouldn't change the human condition. Right. Destroying Rome wouldn't defeat evil. Right. Wouldn't overcome death. Right. It would just take on a new face. 
It would just show up in another place. Uh -huh. Defeating Rome wouldn't renew the world. But I'll tell you, I am the one to punch a hole in the slab between heaven and earth. Yes. To bring God to man mm -hmm. and man to God. Hallelujah. Through my death, burial, and resurrection, which, by the way, you haven't seen yet, mm -hmm. he's telling Nathaniel, I can bring you into the very presence of God. Because Jesus is always more than people are looking for. You can shed your prejudice, whatever your expectations, whatever your hopes, whatever your dreams, there's something much greater in Nazareth. Praise the Lord. No matter what they're hoping for. No matter what they're expecting, no matter what their dreams are, there's something more in Christianity than they have even dared to hope and dream. And that's, that's our responsibility, is to just make it available. To be like Philip and just say, come and see. You know Jesus is calling. You know Jesus is reaching for him. All we have to do is just say, come and see. Pray. Ask for yourself. He wants you more than you can imagine. And he's got more for you than you can ever dream of, than you can Amen. ever in your wildest fantasies Glory. imagine. Amen. It's not only true for the unbeliever who is being drawn to Christ. It's absolutely true even for us. Thank you, Lord. As long as we're in this body, Jesus wants to be more. He wants to show us more. He wants to do more. He wants to be more mm -hmm. for each and every one of us Glory. because he is the Logos. He's the telos. Mm -hmm. He's the beginning. He's the end. He's everything from our start to our finish. Yes. He's the fulfillment of everything that we are or ever hope to be. Amen. He's the purpose. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give him a hand clap. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So all we got to do, again, I'm just saying, we just need to be honest with people because the truth is there's a lot of a lot of people out there trying to get a bicycle. <laughs> they don't know how. Hallelujah. They just need the truth. Because God wants to give them way more than they can even hope for or ask for. So Hallelujah. That's all we gotta do. Glory. Point him to him and he'll do the rest. Amen? Amen. God bless all of you for being here tonight. Appreciate you coming out and suffering through the cold. The Lord bless you, and he will for being faithful. In Jesus' name. You're dismissed. In the name of the Lord. And Dean, I'll be happy to give you a ride home. Thank you. You're more than welcome. No point in walking in this stuff if you don't have.